Hey there, today we're gonna to go ahead and take a look at applying some domain-driven design in a Nest.js project, a, a Nest.js API backend. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and use CQRS, or Command Query Responsibility Segregation, which is a pattern of applying domain-driven design where we separate out our models or our definitions of our entities into two separate models, one for write operations, so updating a model like a user, for example. So the update model uh, is, is created in a particular way, and then there's a whole separate model for reading or querying information about that particular model. So this could be particularly useful in situations where we wanna present a different model when we're reading it versus when we're updating it. And it also allows for a very scalable and loosely coupled architecture compared to a service-driven design, which you typically see in a lot of Nest.js projects. So to go ahead and get started, I've set up an example project in Git as always. I'll put the link in the description so you can check out the repository. Uh, and if you want to follow along from the beginning, I've created a new branch called nestjs-ddd-start. Uh, and additionally, I've created one folder here called campers. We're going to go ahead and create a sample API uh, that is used for a camp, uh, some sort of camp that has campers. And we're going to go ahead and model what these campers look like and apply CQRS to our API in order to update and query the campers. So we have a controller here set up for the campers. Nothing crazy going on. We just have routes to get a camper by ID, get all the campers. We have a post route to create one. And then we have a patch route, which will update the campers allergies with a given camper ID. We have a couple data transfer objects here to the create camper request where we pass the name, age, and allergies. And then the update camper allergies request where we pass along the new array of allergies for a given camper. Now, when you're applying CQRS, it's typically a bit different than a normal CRUD API in that you wanna separate out your, your operations into tasks. So instead of having a particular route just for updating a camper, we have routes for updating the camper allergies. And this would be an operation that we'd want to let the whole application know about potentially. Uh, so say, for example, we update the camper's allergies, then we want to send an email out to uh, an email list of camp counselors to let them know that this camper has updated allergies. So in a typical API, you would see this controller and then you'd have a campers.service and that all of your business really logic would live in that camper service. And for smaller projects, this works just fine, but eventually it starts to get so cluttered. Your services uh, have so many responsibilities and it just doesn't scale well. And it's also very tightly coupled. So CQRS introduces uh, the concept of command handlers and query handlers. So each operation in the system will have its own, will have its own command or query and an associated handler. So each operation has one handler, so it makes the responsibilities of everything in the application very clearly defined. Additionally, I have one other folder called database. I'm going to use a MongoDB database, and I've set up uh, some infrastructure here to allow us to get back an entity uh, with an entity repository. And we'll take a closer look as, at this as we move along. I'm not going to go into too much detail of the underworkings of of uh, this database folder I've created, but if you'd like to check it out, I will definitely include it in the GitHub repo so you can use it in your future projects. So the first thing we're gonna have to do is go ahead and install the nest.js cqrs package. So I'm gonna go ahead and yarn add nest.js cqrs. Okay, so now that we've gone ahead and installed that package, we can go ahead and start setting up campers. So I'm gonna go ahead and create another folder in here called DB, and this is where I'll keep all database related operations for these particular campers. First thing we're gonna to wanna to do is define a schema for a camper. Uh, and essentially this will just be the shape of the data that is stored in MongoDB. So I'm gonna go ahead and export a class called camper schema. And I'm gonna go ahead and extend a class I've created called identifiable entity schema. Uh, 
And if we go ahead and look at this class in the database root folder, all it is is just an abstract class uh, with a ID property with an object ID. So by default, uh, your Mongo documents will get this populated when you insert a new document. So all of our entities will have this ID of type object ID. So we'll just simply extend it here. Now we can go ahead and add additional properties. We'll go ahead and copy these properties that we've specified already. We'll go ahead and then add them to our schema. And then we just need to decorate them with a prop decorator. Lastly, I'm going to go ahead and add the schema decorator. And I'll add the version key here uh, set to false because I don't want my documents to be versioned. We're not going to deal with versioning right now. Uh, and make sure we actually import schema from Nest.js Mongoose. And I'm also going to ahead and name this collection campers. By default, Mongo will take campers schema and populate that with the name, but I want it called campers. So now we have our schema set up. Great. So this is the shape of our data that is stored in the database. And this is all well and good. However, this isn't particularly useful in our application when we want to say, for example, add functionality to this class. So we want to follow the principle in domain driven design of, of having our data live in a class and then have the methods that manipulate that data or use that data live in the same class. So that way we can have data encapsulation and the functionality is all sitting in one place that is using the data in the class. So we can't add methods to this data transfer object because when it comes back from Mongoose, the methods will not be populated. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and create a new file here called camper.ts. And this camper, export class camper, will be the domain model that we will put all of our functionality for the camper in, as well as the data that comes back from Mongoose. Now, we're going to go ahead and actually extend aggregate root from Nest.js CQRS. And you'll see what this allows us to do later on uh, once we add some functionality. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and create a constructor. And I'm going to add read-only properties that are essentially just copied from our from our schema that we've already seen here. So we know it's going to get a name, an age, and an array. Lastly, we're going to get ahead and uh, add a call to the super aggregate root. And now we have our model set up. So all of the data that uh, we'll be using in our in our application uh, is private. So it only only the camper object itself can access it, which is another great advantage of this. Opposed to if we were just passing around the data transfer object in our services, this data that lives in this object is freely mutatable, and it's it's, it's difficult to track down bugs that way. So lastly, we're going to go ahead and have to add getters for these properties. And this is because by default, we're, we're going to need some way to convert the data that lives in our camper model back to a schema so that we can save it later on. And in order to do that, we need to expose these properties. And we'll go ahead and add getters to do that. Now, since these properties here are uh, primitive values, JavaScript is just going to pass back a copy of them. So they won't actually be able to be mutated, which is another great advantage. And I'm going to return a copy of the current allergies because I don't want to return the array that we currently have as that would be passed by reference and callers could then mutate that array. And, and I want to keep this data hidden from our clients. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm just going to pass back an array with all the allergies we currently have. Okay, so now that we have our getter set up, let's go ahead and create that class I talked about, which will help us to convert from a schema or document into a model, and then from a model back to a schema. So I'll call this um, in the DB folder, camper schema factory.ts, because this is going to be a factory that creates objects uh, from the schema and to the schema. So this will be an injectable so that we can use it directly in our repository later on. And we're going to call it camper schema factory. And this is going to implement an interface that we have set up 
called Entity Schema Factory. And if we take a look at Entity Schema Factory, this is an interface that specifies two methods, one of which creates a schema from an entity, and the other creates an entity from a schema. So it expects that we pass in two types, the schema, which extends an identifiable entity schema, which as we've seen earlier is just a object with an object ID. And then it takes in the entity, which we know extends the aggregate root. So in this case, this will be our camper. So let's go ahead and provide these two types. We have our camper schema and then our camper domain model. Okay, so now we can actually implement the two methods that we need. First is gonna be creating the schema given a camper domain model. And we know this is going to return a camper schema. So we're going to need an ID field here and we'll create a new object ID. And we can import object ID from MongoDB. This is actually going to be from Mongo, from Mongoose is the one we want. So we'll pass the new object ID and we're going to call camper dot get and now I just realized we actually need to add one more getter onto this and pass in an ID. And notice that this ID is a string and not an object ID. And that's because we want to keep the domain model really uh, pure and, and free of any dependencies on uh, really any other technologies, including our persistence layer. And an object ID belongs to solely just to the Mongo or MongoDB world. Uh, if we were to swap out the database, we'd want the camper domain model to still be relevant. And in order to do that, we'll just convert the ID to a string uh, when we create the domain model. So then we'll add a getter for it as well. And then we'll call camper.getID, pass in the ID. And make sure we actually import this from MongoDB. And now we need to add the camper name. So that's going to be call camper.getName. So now we have a method which returns a camper schema or document that gets saved in MongoDB from a domain model. And now we need to implement the reverse. So we're going to receive a camper schema. And we will return a camper domain model. So we'll call return new camper. And now we'll pass in the camper dot camper schema dot ID. And since these properties are freely accessible on the uh, schema document. And to make this even less error prone, I'm actually going to even add uh, read only fields, read only des uh, descriptors to these properties so that even if we do pass around this this document uh, only in a few places in our application, we want to make sure that these fields on it are immutable so that we don't actually change those by accident. So we're passing in the ID. Now we need to pass in the name. And then we actually had to call two hex string on this because this is an object ID and it expects a string. So now we've implemented our camper schema factory correctly. Lastly, we can now actually create our camper repository. So let's do just that we will create camper entity dot repository. And the reason why this is an entity repository is because in CQRS, we have different domain models for our write uh, operations. So this domain model is the model that represents our write operations or our commands. It will contain all the methods and functionalities that we need to operate uh, and change the data on the, mo the write model. Conversely, we'll soon create a separate data transfer object that's, that represents the query model for a camper or the model that we return back to clients. And we'll actually have a separate repository to work with that model. So this camper entity repository will work solely with the camper domain model we have set up here because it is an entity. So let's go ahead and add an injectable and export a class called camper entity repository. So this is going to extend our base entity repository. So if we take a look at the base entity repository, this is another abstract class which takes the schema and the entity as type parameters 
and it simply implements a few common methods that we we'd like to have implemented for all of our entities. So finding one by ID, find one and replace by ID, and find all. So this abstraction over our persistence layer allows us to be able to potentially change out our database, but the clients that call this uh, base entity repository will still be able to work because they're just passing in an ID, or in this case, an ID and an entity, and the implementation or the, that we use, the database we use, doesn't really matter. It just, all that matters is that we do in fact find one and replace or find all. So this abstraction will give us more flexibility if we ever have to change databases. So let's go ahead and add those type parameters. So we need the camper schema and then the camper. Now we'll add a constructor and we'll call inject model from Nest.js Mongoose and we'll pass in the model. So this is a camper schema dot name and we'll specify the camper model, which is a model and then pass in the type here so that Mongoose uh, can fill out everything it needs. And then lastly, we'll specify the schema factory that we set up earlier. So camper schema factory and make sure we import this up here as well. So now that we have these dependencies, we can call super, pass in the model, and then the schema factory. Lastly, make sure you import the model from Mongoose up here. And let's just organize these imports. So now we have an entity repository that will retrieve entities for us uh, based on all the operations we have. So if we look at the base entity repository, we can see that this one actually extends another entity repository. And I won't go too much into detail into the inner workings of this. Uh, you can take a closer look in the repository, but more or less what, is, what it does is it takes the schema and the entity and it performs the mongoose operations. So in this case, find one, it will call find one on the entity model. And then it will call entity schema factory, create from schema and provide it the document. So all these methods, find one, find, create, find one and replace. So if we go ahead and take a look at the create camper in our controller, let's go ahead and start with this one. So I'll go ahead and create a new folder called commands. I will create a new file called create camper dot command. And this is just going to be a class called create camper command. It's going to have a constructor that takes in a create camper request. And so this is coming that we can see here. So this, the client will pass us this information uh, from our application. And we can actually make this a read only. So it's immutable. And we'll also create a handler, create camper dot handler dot TS. And this handler is what will actually implement the logic for creating, or at least uh, putting all the pieces together so we can create the camper. So we'll add a decorator called command handler, which takes the command as an argument, which we just created. So we'll pass it in, create camper command. And then we'll export a class called create camper handler. It's going to implement I command handler from Nest.js, which also takes in the command. And uh, then we can go ahead and implement the one method that every handler is expected to implement, and that is async execute, which takes in the command. So this is going to be the create camper command. And because this is a command uh, in the CQRS world, we don't want to return anything from our commands. This will that'll only happen when we query information because the right model, the right model in our application will never be exposed to the clients. It's only used to support and organize our operations around keeping this model up to date. So now we need to implement the logic of how to create a camper. And it could be argued that this, this information should reside directly in the camper model because this is uh, business logic about how to instantiate a camper. Uh, and it could be potentially be domain specific information. I'm going to go ahead and actually create another factory uh, whose sole responsibility is to instantiate new camper 
objects and we will export it camper factory and it's going to implement entity factory that takes in the entity and all entity factory does from database just interface that um, will return an entity or a promise with an entity and we'll simply return a new camper so this is going to be a brand new camper in the application so the ID will be a new object ID. We want uh, Mongoose to be able to generate this for us. So a new camper, and this should be two hex string because it's a string. We'll pass in the name. So by default, we should be getting this as an argument. So let's specify that here. The name will be a string. The age will be a number. And if we look at our data transfer object, we can see it actually does take an array of allergies. So we'll add that here as well as a string, an array of strings. So we can pass in. So now we have a class whose sole responsibility is to create new campers. This domain uh, logic is isolated in this factory, uh, which, is, which is useful if you know, this logic is very complicated. In this case, it was relatively simple, but you could imagine how this could grow in complexity over time. And we want to isolate that. So now we'll add a constructor so that we can inject the camper factory. In our execute method, we're going to call this dot camper factory dot create, and we'll provide it with everything from our command here to destructure the create camper request. And then we can get the name, age, and allergies from the create camper request. So now that we've called create on the factory, uh, we want to be able to um, tell everything else in the application about uh, this operation through an event. Now events are kind of the third type of topic we haven't covered yet in CQRS. So we have commands, which, which are uh, updates to our data to create or update the data. We have queries, which are requests to get the data. And remember, these are separated by two different models. And then lastly, we have the idea of events. So events are issued uh, after a command um, has been triggered. And it's usually asynchronous. So you can imagine after we created a camper, uh, we wanted to let other parts of our application know about it to send an email out maybe then this is a perfect use case for an event. We send off the event, and then the email service could use that event to send out that information to all relevant parties. And the important part, though, is it's decoupled from this process of creating a camper. You can see the pattern here of loose coupling and uh, separation of concerns in our application. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like about how do we could trigger an event that now that we've created the camper. So what I'll do uh, to get set up for our event, I'll create a new folder called events and I'll call it camper created.event. And this is gonna follow a very similar structure to our handler. And let's say for this example, we'd really only need the ID of the newly created camper so the email service could then use that to find the camper and send off the relevant information to the interested parties. So we'll just add a camper ID here, and then we'll add a handler for this event. So every uh, command query and event has its own handler. So this has the decorator event handler, where we pass in the event, similar to the, very similar to the command camper created event. We'll export a class called camper created handler and this is going to implement i event handler where we can then pass in the event and similar to our handler this takes one method and this method is called handle and this is an asynchronous that takes in the event camper created event we can destructure the camper ID out of this and this is just going to have a void return type so now in this uh, camper created handler I'm just going to log out the camper ID that we that we get we want to implement any email services with this uh, new camper ID but I'll leave that to you if you'd like to implement that
So now back to our handler, we need some way to uh, associate this newly created camper with the, hand the event handler in our system. And in order to do that, we'll go back to our camper factory. And before returning the newly created camper, we're gonna call camper dot apply. And what apply does is it is it tells your your uh, entity so this entity extends the aggregate root and the aggregate root has this apply method that uh, essentially broadcasts out events to, to the system so that they can respond to them so the apply takes an event so in this case camper created event we'll pass in the camper ID so we've applied this event and then we'll pass the camper out of the factory yet again so we've created the camper and then we call camper.commit and commit is going to be the last operation like a git commit that will save all of the events that we've applied uh, during the, the life cycle of the object so in this case it will broadcast our camper created event now there's one last thing we need to do is we need to inject uh, an event publisher from NestJS CRS. And the event publisher is what's going to link this aggregate root object up so that it can respond properly. Our event handler can know about it properly. So to do that, we'll just simply call or wrap the camper with this .event publisher .merged object context, And then we'll pass in the camper object to that. So now this camper is just associated with all the handlers in the system. We've created it, applied an event, committed. So now that we've actually created the camper locally, we want to persist the creation of the camper. And, that, and by that, we want to save it in our database. So that uh, functionality, I believe, belongs in the camper factory. After we create it, we want to save it in the database. So that's simple enough to do. We can just inject our camper entity repository so before we apply the camper created event I'll call await this dot repository dot create and we can simply pass in the entity and it expects the camper because of the types we've provided then I'll have to make this method asynchronous and update the return type so now we should be uh, persisting the camper before we before we apply the event, the camper created event. So we'll have to add an await to our create call here as well. So now we can come back into our controller and uh, we can call await. And we need a way to dispatch this uh, command in our system. So to do that, NestJS provides uh, a object called the, or not event bus, the command bus. There's a separate bus for events and queries but the command bus will allow us to dispatch commands. So we'll call command bus .execute, and we can provide types here as well. So uh, we can provide the actual command, which will be create camper command. And then the return type, in this case it's void. So then we pass a new create camper command and it expects the request. So we'll just pass along the request. So now we're calling command bus to execute, passing in the command and sending the request through. So now that we've set up our controller, the last thing to do is wire everything together in our app module. So let's open that up. And we actually only need to wire this up in the, uh, the campers module, which I realize we don't have set up yet. So let's do that now. So the module here, we're gonna uh, add an imports array. We're gonna need CQRS module. We can add our controllers. We have our campers controller and then our providers. So this is an important part here. So we need to add all the injectables that we set up. So if you remember, that was the camper entity repository, the camper schema factory, the camper factory itself. And then we need to add our event handlers and our command handlers. And I found the easiest way to do that is to create an index.ts file here and we'll call export command handlers, camper command handlers, and we'll add our command handlers, create camper handler. And now when we add a new handler, we just need to add it to this array and export a const here. Uh, and we'll do the same thing for the events. So a new file here. So now in our module, 
we will just spread the uh, campers camper command handlers and the camper event handlers and now in our app module I'll get rid of the controller here and I'll import the campers module we'll also make sure that we need to add the mongoose module dot for feature where we pass in an array with the name of the schemas that we've set up so this is the camper schema dot name and then the schema will be schema factory create for class and then pass in the camper schema and make sure we also uh, import the database module here as well so everything gets wired up properly so let's make sure that we have our server running in the background we'll call yarn start dev and make sure it starts up properly so the server has started and we'll open up postman so I'm calling post localhost 3000 slash campers and I'm passing in the body with an age of Steven, age 19, allergies, peanuts. So we'll send this request off to the server and we have a 201 recreated status that gets comes back. And if we look at the logs for application, we can see our event handler fired off properly. So we can see camper created and the ID of the camper that was created. This is what we've set up in our event handler. If you remember, right here. And if we go ahead and look at the database, we can see that the camper did get saved.